I can hear them say like, do you not recognize I'm 1%? I demand a watch to tell the plebs that I am 1%. And the message when I see something like that is that, oh, I can afford to spend 20 times over for the same thing because it has a different color. And what I care about is that I'm differentiated from other people because I spent 20 times over. On this week's show, if you know, you already know. But just in case you're not in the know, we continue the tour of Watch Some Wonders with Grand Seiko, Tag Heuer and Zenith. We ask, what can you do in three hours for the anniversary of Watch from Blanc Pas? What mythical creatures Constantine has left to recreate in watch form? If bumping your watch is better than winding it with Alpina? And we all rather enjoy the new GMT from Bomb and Mercier. And as Ariel is MIA this week, we had to draft in two replacements in the form of Simon and Alex. Enjoy the show! Greetings and welcome to this week's A Blog to Watch Weekly. Ario is otherwise indisposed in London as it happens. So we have had to replace him with two people because, you know, it's two for the price of one to get the the sheer watch knowledge plus humour. We decided we need two people. Now I want you to decide which one is replacing the humour and which one is replacing the watch knowledge. But we welcome back to the show Simon from Escapement 24 and Alex, the watch regulator from Fifth Rush Radio. Good morning, gentlemen. Hello, everyone. Good morning. I'm definitely not replacing the knowledge, that's for sure. Same year. Is it possible that I've actually invited two people to bring the humour and neither of you are bringing the knowledge? In which case, we need to rely on David to bring the watch knowledge. How are you this morning, David? Good morning. Uh, yeah, I'm very well. Well, there is loads to crack on with this week, so we're going to launch right into it. David, you have written a fantastically winding up article, <laughs> a grind, part of the Grinding Gear series, the case against if you know, you know in watch design and collecting. Yep. Give us the elevator pitch. You're the senior editor and you get to choose to do whatever you want. Yeah. Why was this where you went? <laughs> yeah, it's funny because uh, every time when I, or well, actually, often when I when I'm writing a review or a hands-on or a news coverage or something else, topics come up in my mind, and I feel like I just, you know, I'm tempted to go on a rent in that article, and I figure, you know, that's not what people come here for. Sure, I will put in a few little droplets of information or insight or something like that, but then we realize that there should be a column that collects these and and directs the focus at these issues without uh, any you know disruptions uh, or other watch news or whatever else you know yeah this uh, this article is about eye kick <laughs> as i would say it it's if you know you know it's a, it's a trending hashtag it's out there everywhere and uh, it's also in watch design and i've been thinking about this is for another discussion maybe a, a few minutes later but i wonder what other consumer items there are or products there are out there that have a strong and if you know you know element to them as watches do and for the uninitiated i think we should discuss first what this means and this means that your watch if you have and if you know you know kind of watch then uh, your watch has a little trait a little design element to it maybe a tiny illegible line of text on the dial or, or a dial color or a bezel color or something like that to tell your peers that you have paid many times over for what essentially is technically speaking the same watch or a dot over 90 or a snoopy mm -hmm. or any of these sort of things alex what's the most if you know, you know trait in watchmaking that you've come across. I mean, this is basically about saying it's... I mean, is it really that if you know, you know? Because the whole point is that it's not really that. It's like fake news. This is like, I know you know that this is telling you Good point. that I uh, have more that I have more money than you, that I know more about this topic or, or similar. I think it should be broken into two categories. There's the kind of natural occurrence of this. So I've got a vintage dive watch that's got what's called a Salazar stamp on the top left lug, which was something that happened in Portugal to show that you'd paid tax on your watch a certain period of time when you had a dictator. Uh -huh. And then there's all the kind of forced stuff that brands tend to do now, which they always overdo. So I think it does need to be in two separate camps, but people don't really care about the... The forced, if you know, you know thing, because people people know why you're doing it, why you're wearing a watch like that. <laughs> kind of find this thing really pointless, completely pointless. And you know, I guess these watch brands do kind of sell a lot of these things. But you know, I mean, I, I was when I was reading the article, it reminded me a little bit of um, what used to happen with cars, more so than watches, I guess. But actually, in the world of cars, it was 
more of a genuine, because the if you know you know part was usually there was a performance benefit. So it, it reminded me of the, does anyone remember the old uh, Volvo T5, which was, you know, they used to yep. refer to as a, a wolf in sheep's clothing, because, you know. Uh-huh. So I had one. Yeah, right. Well, there you go. You know, it, it wasn't the, the greatest looking thing, you know, and it looked pretty ordinary apart from the wheels, I think. But this was an absolute killer machine. But this whole thing about kind of just changing a dial colour or changing a bezel colour, it's just kind of, uh, it's just money making as far as I'm concerned. And, you know, it just doesn't really light my fire. Having said all that, I then had to check myself because I was thinking, have I just bought the ultimate if you know, you know watch because I've just bought a Bamford Monaco. (laughs) <laughs> so that's like I'm thinking mm, maybe, maybe I've just kind of done what I the thing that I said I kind of hate so Simon is leading with his Bamford uh, Alex is leading with his Salazar stamp uh, they, they they both now fall into the category of yeah boys just admit it you're leading with if you know you know David what's your most if you know you know watch just on the note of the Bamford Monaco I think I think that doesn't really apply here and the reason why yeah, is that it, and the reason why you're excused is because if you wanted a forced <laughs> carbon Monaco that was the only way to go if you wanted that color weight it was the only way to go so it was a very unique presentation of that watch as opposed to something like a uh, I bring this example in the article, a white gold Submariner that has a blue bezel. And the only way to tell, you know, with your, uh, you know, uh, visibly tell um, that it is white gold is to know that Rolex only places blue bezels on Submariners if they have gold in them. They can be Rolex Store, which is a two-tone, or they have to be solid gold. That's the only way. You will never get a blue bezel on a steel uh, Submariner these days. So so that's that's the if you know, you know kind of thing. And uh, there, the message is like... I'm going to take that as an official pardon. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> it is. I, I think I think you, you totally get a pass on that. <laughs> Redemption. Uh, so anyway, I think this this is where uh, the performance benefit comes into play because this is like a forced carbon watch and, uh, when it comes to this Bamford Monaco and you get some performance benefits. And the same with cars. It's ridiculous to think that, uh, you know, if, if a car had something like different color brake calipers and then everyone would be like, oh, wow, you paid four times as much for the same car with yellow calipers, you know. And sure, this applies to cars in some ways with ceramic brakes and all the rest of it. We can get into that or tailor made with Ferrari. Uh, yeah, I've kind of done that as well. Yeah, yeah, you see. It's easy. <laughs> I mean, we're tempted all the time. But at the same time, uh it's I think I think that the, the submariner is a, is, a, is a very strong example here. So, who's the most guilty of this? The watch brands or the kind of A-listers demanding that they have this kind of access to a watch that's just that little bit different like so the one that's obviously all over the article is the Patek, the 5711 with the Tiffany blue dial. What drove that? Patek going, oh yeah, yeah, let's do this, or a number of their brand acolytes going, yeah, we want a 5711, but we want something that shows that our 5711 is even more special than the run of the mill. And, you know, somebody in Patek had the brainwave of going, I know what we'll do, we'll put a tiffany blue dial on it i think it's just a sign of for me a sign of bad taste almost isn't it if you you know if you're the kind of person who demands this from a watch you know want something that is just so subtly different that really in theory not many people will know but actually everyone knows to me it's just kind of having more money than than sense or more money than taste I, I I think I can hear them say like, do you not recognize I'm one percent? You know, and I demand a watch to tell the you know the plebs that I am one percent, and that's the color is what this color is about, and that is also part of the reason why the fifty fifty seven eleven blew up so much because it became a status symbol. And I say this, I clarify this very early on in the article. I don't mind any of that. It's it's not this article is not really about what non watch savvy people uh, how how they spend their uh, money on watches and and how they wear their or flaunt their watches or do whatever other lowly behaviors in modern society with them that I discuss, but rather how we watch collectors and enthusiasts react to us. And I bring up this example that we're sitting at this dinner table and there's like twelve or fifteen of us at you know one of these major events and it happened all the time. And one of these watches pops up and it's it's the typical if you know you know kind of watch and the message there is not like oh you have that watch that's great no but it's like oh you have that version of that watch and you're celebrated for having that line of text or something else and 
the the technical refinement and the other important and interesting aspects of that very watch are lost on them because it's just a a meaningless weightless little modification to the design of the watch and that gets you all the oohs and ahs and as opposed to having a watch that is technically interesting you see i think that's that's where this this uh, discrepancy is so do you have a favorite not necessarily of the watches that are in the article do you have a favorite if you know you know like something that you would spot or that you would go, I actually, you know what? I don't mind that if you know, because that's proper deep dive. Like, it's not just that you're a geek, you are the geek of geeks because you're wearing that or that's the one you bought. So for me, for example, I think if I saw somebody wearing, and it's, it's a bit random, but if I saw somebody wearing a pan ride that had an equation of time on it, I'd be like, yeah, you didn't just buy the Panerai that everybody else buys, you, for whatever bizarre reason, decide that what you really needed was, like, the most random complication on the most random dive watch. And therefore, I'm thinking, you probably know something about watches. Whether you have good taste in them is a different matter, but I'm thinking, you're someone I can go up to and go, hello, I really like watches too. Uh, do you like, you know, kind of start that really awkward conversation <laughs> with somebody randomly. Simon, is there something you've seen or would say, actually, if I saw that somebody was wearing that, I'd be like, yeah, I'm going to go and speak to that person. Well, I think it goes back to Alex's point, really. I think there are just two different versions of this whole concept, aren't there? Because, you know, there are so many amazing iterations of the Speedmaster, you know, and historical versions that, you know, have got lots of very, very subtle um elements to them let's say you know whether it's indices whether it's that whole dot over 90 thing whatever i don't know a whole lot about that genre um it's not my specialist subject but i can appreciate there are a lot of people who do and who buy those watches and like those watches because they like that uniqueness to it but that's not doing it in a forced way whereas i think it's when you have the tiffany blue on the dial of a watch where it's just a, a different dial color because they've seen a way of making almost a niche of their own product and charge you a lot more money for it, then I think that's where I really have to take issue with this whole thing. Okay, Alex, is there something you would look out for? Something almost like a dream watch that you wish you'd see somebody wearing? It's not going to be like an mb &F or something gazillion dollar, but it's going to be... Ah, uh, you're, you're ruining this for me then, because I was going to say the ultimate, if you know, you know watch, has to be the Black Panther AP, <laughs> but not the one that they did a few of. Uh -huh. The one that they auctioned, where where it had the vibranium case or whatever it was, they said. <laughs> so you'd be like, "Oh, that isn't just a regular Black Panther watch. You're the special person that spent seven million for the vibranium <laughs> case. Like, who wouldn't want to meet that special person?" David, what would be the ultimate find in the if you know you know category? Yeah, the ultimate. If we mean it in a positive way, then it would be something like a spring drive where you can tell, you know, from the shape of the watch and from the way maybe the second hand moves or maybe where the power reserve is or something like that. Probably the power reserve is a better example because it's easier to spot. That, that, is, that is like what you described with the equation of time, but, you know, much more popular and, and there's a greater chance to encounter it. <laughs> and that still says, like, hey, you like watches. If you have equation of time on your watch, then you're probably an absolute nerd in, uh, in terms of watches and horology. And the same with spring drive, as far as I'm concerned. And nobody just walks into a Grand Seiko boutique to begin with, let alone pick a spring drive, <laughs> you know, so yeah, probably yeah, there's a good chance that uh, you can recognize. But so this is a positive way, I think. And, and there's a technical benefit from that. Whether a dial is blue or black, there is no um, technicity behind that or, or any sort of technical prowess or engineering, engineering prowess. And that is where my issue is that you're charged five or 10 or 15 or 20 times over sometimes crazy amounts for a different color that is essentially free. And it's uh, to produce and it's it's this uh, um, artificial uh, exaggeration of pricing and desirability that comes from totally weightless and 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 costless just essentially free modifications so you're paying all that extra and you're you the message when i see something like that is that oh i can afford to spend 20 times over for the same thing because it has a different different co uh, color and what i care about is that i'm differentiated from other people 
because I spent 20 times over. And that's that's a very shallow message. And it's okay. I mean, this is the world, world we live in, and I'm not preaching against it. It supports the industry. But I think us, which enthusiasts, should not be celebrating these kinds of things as much as uh, sometimes I see that we do. Does anyone actually care other than the owner of the watch, though? That's what I'm thinking. As somebody who, this is, I don't know if this counts as a humble brag because it wasn't my watch, but as someone who wore a Tiffany stamp day date to the Danny Wellington Christmas party, <laughs> the managers at work were no more upset than they were the previous year when I just wore a plain linen dial day date. So I think nobody cares unless it's your own watch. People don't really care. Is that just a reflection of the people you hang around with at work? This you know? is probably true as well, yeah. I, I, <laughs> I'm just realising though, I would take, I'm, I'm going to take back my panorama because I've just realised what the most, if you know, if you know, but I've never seen this version next to the £1,000 version and it's actually a watch we've talked about a fair, it always comes up, it's one of these sideways watches. It's that £70,000 gold G-Shock. Mm. Now we're talking. Solid gold one. <laughs> I don't know if anyone's ever seen it sat next to the gold colored version to see if you can actually tell them apart at a distance. But I'm just realizing, actually, if you could somehow spot that it was real without... I suppose if you shook hands with a person and realized you were being dragged downwards <laughs> to the, the floor. The inertia. <laughs> but by the inertia and the kilo of gold on the wrist, that would maybe be the only way. Hmm. But actually, that gold G-Shock... I think I'd give the prize to rather than the pan arrive with the equation of time. And I think, Alex, if you were wearing that, you would care. No. No. I, I want to change mine if you're going to change okay, yours. Go on, then. <laughs> I want I want to change mine to the, the Hitler's JLC reversal. <laughs> 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 now yes. that is an if you know, you know watch. Now we're talking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the ultimate. Okay, we're continuing our tour of Watches and Wonders. We have Zenith, Tag, and Grand Seiko. We've already spoken a little bit about Grand Seiko. Let's speak a bit more about them. They're the odd one out in Watches and Wonders, being distinctly not Swiss or European. They came out with this amazing watch last year. I think it was it yourself that recorded the audio from it? Yeah, the Kodo, yeah. I recorded the sound of it. Do we think we're going to see more from Grand Seiko of that ilk? Or is that a once in a five, ten year watch and we're just going to see more run-of-the-mill things about mountains and lakes and rivers and, I don't know, seaside? It's funny because I, I wouldn't be surprised if we saw something right this, you know, uh, directly uh, following year uh, after 2022 in the Kodo. I wouldn't be surprised if we saw something like that. And I equally would not be surprised if Grand Seiko just put everything on hold for the next 10 years. So we, we'll see. I, it definitely takes a huge team uh, and tremendous dedication from them to create something like that. And the reason why I, I like that you mentioned that I recorded the sound, it was one of the most glorious sounding watches I've ever heard. It was it was unbelievable. I, I, I was just, there's a photo of me that, that I have my ears next to it, ear next to it, and I'm just smiling like crazy because I'm like, this is insane. It's like the perfect sound for a TikToking watch. Uh, maybe you guys can find it on YouTube or somewhere else. It's just one of the most fantastic watches ever. And uh, I hope we will see something like that this year. But and on the run of the mill stuff, do you think it's just going to be more of the same? I mean, I'm, I've said this before. At the moment, I just feel a bit confused by what Grand Seiko are doing. They just appear to be chucking models at the wall and seeing what sticks, what attracts everybody's attention. It's like, oh, here's this thing over here. It's this really cool dive watch. Oh, here's this chronograph. Oh, here's this really simple watch with great finishing. It, they just appear to be jumping from side to side rather than trying to... I don't know, develop their own identity. They almost seem to just be trying to keep up with the Joneses. It's maybe why they're situated next to Tag, because Tag are probably in the, the same boat. It's, if you just want to see a load of stuff, go to this corner of Pal Expo, where you can find Tag and Grand Seiko. Do we think we're going to see a clearer, or do you, do you agree? <laughs> no, I was going to say, I think I remember saying this on the last episode, that it seems like Grand Seiko 
are trying too much to copy the the Swiss. And the best thing about Grand Seiko is they aren't Swiss, but now, yeah, it seems to be they're trying to play the game a bit too much. I don't know if that's due to kind of a, a man change in management style or them trying to be more competitive because obviously they are they're more on the on the stage now than they have been in the past they're not just an enthusiast watch they're more well known now um but i can't see them changing anything i don't think we've seen any significant like minor changes that would yeah signal that they're going to be doing anything differently so i think it's going to be business as usual kind of all the kind of standard beautiful dials that they do every now and again something truly special and then yeah all the 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 misses as well that, that's thrown into the mix in some ways what you just said is really maybe what they've become known for um, so rather than having a, a a niche in a particular direction they've almost become known for having a real cross-section of different styles um complications you know it's that's how i see them anyway david what would be a reasonable strategy for grand seiko like what would you like to see them do it's difficult because a lot of people want the Grand Seiko, but in a lot of different flavors. And Rolex had a long time to figure this out and to brew these things or boil these things down to their essence. I saw this picture that was really funny that had an oyster bracelet watch with the dial blacked out. Just, you know, like you couldn't see the face of the watch. And they were five different Rolex watches, an Air King, you know, an Oyster Perpetual uh, or, or whatever else, like five different models in the same case, same bracelet, same movement. But, oh, I'm wearing an Air King, so I'm just, I'm, I'm different than the guy wearing the, the same watch with the same movement and the same case and the same bracelet, you know. So I think that's, that's too far in the other direction. I think where Grand Seiko could help its audience is just, just a little bit better explanation. Like, this is where we are going, you know, yes, we believe in like larger cases, smaller cases should you wait for something like that because there's it's so difficult to see what these brands are going to do and i think the question you're asking is relevant to um, watch customers because they want to prepare for a purchase like this and there's this pressure from grand seco sometimes it happened to me actually as well like i went into the boutique and i said oh you know there was this watch it had this really cool case it was angular and it was like a spring drive or a high beat or whatever else and i i want that watch and oh well they don't make it anymore and i'm like how long how long was it in production for like maybe two years or a year and a half and Sure, maybe you can go there and pick that up, but at the same time, there's this pressure that, oh, maybe I will miss something that would be a little bit smaller or more to my taste or whatever else. So there's this choice paralysis element, and that is why people try and find or figure out the strategy of a brand so that they can pull these factors into the future and say, does it align with my taste? Or is there a chance that it will align better with my taste as it does right now? You know, so. It's not a question whether or not Grand Seiko products today are desirable. I think the movements are great, the cases are great, the prices are getting up there and sometimes they're just stupid. But you can still go to a Grand Seiko boutique and pick up a really nice watch that is beautifully engineered for, for, a, for a reasonable price. So I think, again, to, to answer your question, I think it's, it's more about communication and not learning this uh, secrecy, this tendency or this uh, desire for secrecy from the Swiss because it's just stupid. You can go out and you can say whatever you want to do with uh, spring drive uh, because the Swiss will not copy, right? And, and anyway, anyway, who cares? You know? So just be more open for a change with your customers and, and be upfront to them uh, when it comes to your future plans. I think that's interesting bringing up the Rolex thing there because i think if one thing we could probably all agree on in the watch enthusiast community is that brands could do with releasing less watches and that's something rolex aren't ever kind of guilty of they have their set core collection every now and again they might do something a little bit wacky but you can dependent on your taste you might have one or two rolexes that you like the look of if you were to go through all the grand seikos there might be 10 or 20, 30 Grand Seikos that you would want to to own. Yeah. And I think the problem with that is if you have so many watches coming out all the time, you're constantly just spinning plates, running from one to the other. You're never really fine-tuning your core collection the way Rolex has done over the years, where each year you're just fine-tuning it, making that little bit better, a little bit better. Instead, Grand Seiko and a lot of the other brands are guilty of okay, let's try this other thing now. We haven't perfected this other one that's out to the public, but let's create something else now so somebody buys something new. And I think, yeah, I think 
people should think about that with copying Rolex rather than just copying dial colors or uh, gems or whatever it is they're actually doing with the watches. Hi, I'm Ariel Adams, founder of A Blog to Watch with a message from eBay, a platform I probably use daily. Make sure your watches are the real deal with eBay Authenticity Guarantee. I believe it's the first and best service of its kind that protects your luxury purchases and checks each watch individually at eBay's highly reputable authentication partner, Stolen Company, in the United States. From band to bezel, their authenticators ensure each wristwatch matches the eBay listing and is the real deal. Authenticity guarantee is also very fast. Once authentication is complete, your watch is securely delivered via rapid two-day shipping. Surprisingly, eBay's authenticity guarantee service is free for all watches priced $2,000 and up. No one should buy a luxury item without an authenticity guarantee. Do what I do and check eBay before each watch purchase because everyone deserves real. Elsewhere in what is basically LVMH corner, because you've also got Ublo, which we spoke about last week, is Tag and Zenith. Now, Tag appear to me to be slightly ahead of Grand Seiko, and I don't know why I feel this way, but it kind of feels like Tag have got over this, we have so many models all doing X, Y, and Z, to starting to seem like they have a bit of a theme running, and actually they're producing watches that are increasingly making me go, oh, that's actually quite nice. I quite fancy one of them. Or I'd try that on as opposed to thinking, no, that's just a bit overpriced, a bit derivative. Tag seem to be on a, a reasonably rich vein of form at the moment. Simon, are you a Tag fan? I am a Tag fan. Um, I tend to be a fan more of their kind of historic models, the race you know, things like the Monaco, the Monza, um, you know, th those are the ones that really speak to me. Um, I think that, uh, as we probably all agree, that I think their strategy in the past has been, um, or certainly in, let's say, the last 10 to 15 years, they've had lots of um, entry-level sports watches, you could say, with their Formula One collection in particular. Um, and that really hasn't done them any favours. Um, what are we going to see from them going forward? I, I think it's... For me, I'm, I think it's hard to say. Um, you know, I think we may well see more newer iterations of some of the historic pieces. Um, but I'm quite looking forward to, to what does come along. Yeah, I think that new Aqua Racer range and the possibility that the Monza is going to get a bigger rollout beyond the flyback that was recently released, I think are quite attractive. I still, I mean, I know you love your tag horror monocles but i think they're just really difficult to wear you know I, i'm so surprised actually hearing i know david was talking about this on one of the recent shows and i mean i i'm at a real end of the market where my wrists are so skinny that i find most watches difficult to wear and funnily enough the monaco is one that i don't struggle with at all oh that's cool it's that's great i have a skinny wrist as well and I, maybe it's maybe it's because of the forged carbon that it's light it doesn't wobble around too much or something like that. Maybe that maybe that's something to do with it. Yeah, that's that's just good to hear. I'm I'm still very tempted to get a Monaco at some point for sure. <laughs> so even though it doesn't fit you, it doesn't wear well, you're still tempted to get one. Is that not kind of like some sort of if you know, you know, you just need to show off that you've got that you've got a Monaco. <laughs> if you know if you know you shouldn't, then you know you shouldn't. That's how I would complete the sentence. Yeah, that's that's next week's sequel. Alex, are you in any way excited by Tag and the prospects uh... of Watson Wonder? The last thing I, I liked from them was the the case they did with the diamonds or the oh, yeah. man-made diamonds set into it. Tag's a bit a kind of a funny one as well because they've got all that great brand heritage, but I often say on on my hit podcast <laughs> that um, it's they kind of it's a squandered heritage and they never really seem to know what to do with it. It's almost like they should have a split brand for their heritage part where they just have the Hoyer and make it almost like a, a Tudor type of brand that just does heritage reissue things and then have their mainstream stuff separately from mm -hmm. that. There's been a few things. I think the Aqua Racer is looking better all the time and it certainly has that mass market appeal. But I think there is still a bit of uncertainty about what it is they're actually trying to do and what they're trying to achieve. I think once they've worked that out, then they can properly kind of solidify themselves and their position in the market. 
And then we have Zenith just uh, round the corner with them, also part of LVMH Group. David, how do you see the interaction between the LVMH Group brands at a big show like this? You have many more years of experience at going to these kind of things where, you know, brands that are effectively all under the same roof, but all competing with each other. Hmm. What's, what's your thoughts on the crossover between all these brands being in the one corner? It's also not a bit odd the LVMH group don't say to the organisers, can you not just spread us about a bit? I mean, is it just because they're all saying in the same coffee run or something that they all want to be in the same corner? But you'd have thought dotting them around the place yeah. would be better. Yeah, well, uh, it's funny you mentioned this because uh, on the note of Tag Heuer, uh, I, you know, I respect Tag because it, it carries the flag for the Swiss watch industry in, in more ways that we often give it credit for. You know, whenever they come out with, uh, with a new Formula One, for example, or a new cheap aqua, cheaper aqua racer or something like that, I'm always, I, I, I'm always excited and I always scrutinize those because those are the watches that people go out and buy as a gift or buy to themselves as their first Swiss made watch from a, from a bigger brand, right? So those have to yeah. be great products. And yet here we are, you know, uh, lifting our pinkies and, and saying like, oh, you know, give us like the craziest, you know, most historically correct tech hoyer. And we're pulled, and you know, we are also right in that demand. But at the same time, tech hoyer is being pulled in two very different directions because they have to cater to the sub $2,000 segment as much as they have to cater to those of us who can spend uh, many times more than that if we like a design and if we like a concept and if we like an execution. So uh, it's, it's, it's tough for Tag. Um, I think they are in a more difficult situation than any of the other three brands uh, under LVMH, mm -hmm. right? Zenit can do whatever it wants as long as it stays technical. Uh, the Defy Xtreme, I think, is an excellent, excellent watch. It's uh, basically the modern and cool Royal Oak Offshore, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, when I saw that watch yeah. with all the colors and all that, uh, that bonkers case and, and crazy movement, I was like, wow, I have to have one of these. But then again, it's, of course, huge. So there it goes. And Hublot is Hublot. <laughs> you know, Hublot can do basically, again, it, it's it's built itself this huge sandbox. It's, it, it's much less constrained than many others in its segment. So again, I think Tag is, 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 is in a very, very difficult situation. Uh, because, you know, like there, there's this watching this section of the watch enthusiast community that's extremely trigger happy when it comes to like, oh, Mario Kart, like bam, 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 shots fired immediately. You, you shouldn't do that. But at the same time, the, the watch industry has to have a major brand that people know already exists as a major Swiss watch brand that democratizes this, this concept of having a Swiss brand, a Swiss watch, right? And I think right now that is Tag Heuer. And again, I respect them for, for, uh, for tackling this situation the best they can. Let's review some actual watches. First up this week is, and here's my question. We're going to look at the Konstantin Chaikin. This is the Smilodio, Smilodon watch. I'm assuming that's something. Uh, Smil is it Smilodon? Is that how you pronounce it? Smilodon, Smilodon watch. Smilodon, Constantine yes. Chaikin debuts as Smilodon watch. Okay, here's my question. Is it enough already? Just stop it. Find another trick. Move along. Produce a pony watch and then find another trick pony. Have we just had too many of the iterations <laughs> of what was a great design with the original Joker, but is now just delving into whatever they've had to delve into to come up with a smile on? The, the bottom of the barrel. The bottom of the barrel. Can we have a watch celebrating the bottom of the barrel? Or <laughs> is it just these are these, these are just the, the barrel diver. <laughs> the barrel diver is uh, the barrel dweller. Like, don't get Two me wrong. Water mm. resistance. He's a great guy. They're great watches, but take a beat, man. You've got so many other great watches that you produce. I mean, some of the the mystery dial stuff, the Mars stuff, it's absolutely phenomenal. Do we do we just need to say for the rest of 2023? Don't go near Halloween. Don't go near Easter. We don't want to know what he did during your summer holidays or on a Greek island or whatever. <laughs> Just stay away. Stick to nuts. You know, stay away from fantasy books and Terry Pratchett. Here's the thing. No more eyes on watches, please. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've visited uh, Konstantin and his manufacturer in, in Moscow a number of years ago. I think it was like, I don't know, 2018 or something like that. 
And and you know he he is an incredibly talented and and and, and gifted and mm. creative uh, watchmaker. One one of the one of the greatest of all time. Easy. And the fact that he's created something like this, I think it's called the Wristmon or Wrist Monster a series. It, it's something that is incredibly popular, and it I, the way I look at it is that it helps him pay the bills and 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 has yeah. like a consistent revenue stream and. If you look at like exactly the ones that you mentioned and many more besides the mysterious clocks and and Mars watches and all the rest of it, it's it's just amazing you know what he can do and I think these watches allow him to be creative without having to worry about paying his people, paying for the manufacturer, paying for the bills, and it creates a bunch of happy customers who are still looking forward to, for something like this. I mean they, they are extremely rare. He's produced maybe, I think he produced like 100 Joker watches or 99 Joker watches or something like that of the original versions and maybe a few hundred more besides over the years in, uh, in different variations. It's still, still unbelievably rare, right? But it is because yeah. it's such a prominent design. We, we feel like, we, we rightfully feel like we've seen it so many times, even though we haven't. But it just makes such a lasting impression, even even though it was five months ago that you saw the last one, right? But if Oris launches another dive watch, you're not like, stop making dive watches, <laughs> even though you've seen those hundreds of times. But they don't make a lasting impression, and this one does. I think David's spot on with that. It keeps the keeps the lights on for them. but And also the fact that it, they are a rare watch, but it's more about the kind of public perception. And it feels a bit like they're releasing as many as Grand Seiko do, <laughs> special or limited editions. It, it really does. And I thought it was interesting as well when you said, is it enough already? It felt like it was enough for me maybe about a year ago. And while it allows them to keep the lights on and make other watches, at what point does it actually, yeah, like it hurts the brand at some point where it's that thing that's that's been done to death? And then people aren't as interested about the other things because they're a kind yeah, of one-hit wonder, if you like. Are we just saying it, it would be okay to switch the lights off occasionally is what we're saying? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Make it one, maybe one a year. How, how many of these do they do? Make it one, uh -huh. one a year, have one special one a year. I think even that, they might should maybe uh -huh. take a year off before doing another one because it just, whatever the public perception is, it just feels like they've gone past the kind of tipping point. And there's just a little bit too many of them out there, whether that's actually the case or not. I mean, maybe the alternative is to, like, make other suggestions. Like, I'm thinking the Loch Ness Monster needs one of these watches. Oh, God. <laughs> I think, no. uh, something with some tartan in it and a tail kicking out the back. Oh. I, th I think I think that's that's what it needs. The Yeti. Have we, have we had a Yeti one yet? What other mythical figures are there? I knew it was only a matter of time before you, you Scottish guys yeah. got together and, and started plotting to take over the universe. I don't want any part of this. Okay? <laughs> yeah. Please, thank you. No credit required. We're going to listen to some audio from Mike, who has reviewed an interesting watch from Alpina. Hi everyone, Mike Razak here to talk about the Alpina Star Timer Pilot Heritage Manufacture. This is a watch that has been released previously and two new editions were released and I got to go hands-on with the blue brush dial. This watch is limited to 188 pieces, priced at $31.95. It's no doubt an attractive watch and it wears quite well and it has a novel movement, a bumper movement as opposed to the traditional 360 degree rotor, but it does leave me scratching my head as to why Alpina thought it was such a great idea to revive an obsolete and inefficient movement. What are your thoughts? Okay, so this, there's obviously some history to this within Alpina, this type of watch, but whenever I see this kind of bump movement, I'm looking at the Morris Grossman Hamatic, which is just one of the most gorgeous movement watches anywhere. It's easily... And I can say this because Ariel's not on the show, is easily in my top three dress watches or movements. It's probably one of the one of the watches you would wear the other way around, just so as you can see this thing working. Now that's I don't know how much they are, they're tens of thousands of pounds. This Alpina, which is the Alpina Star Timer Pilot, with a bumper movement. So we're talking about rather than the rotor 
going all the way around in order to power the watch. It effectively works a little bit like an internal pendulum. It bumps from side to side and that's what winds the mainspring. And so this is tech right back in a watch that is only a few thousand dollars. Do we understand why Alpina have done this, David? I honestly have absolutely no idea, but uh, it, it's cool. It's, it's, <laughs> it's quirky. I think, you know, like uh, uh, probably one of their movement designers had a field day or maybe he was unmonitored for a week and he just slapped this together and then before anyone could pull the plug on the project, it was already done. And it, it's cool. It, it was a niche for sure. And it is a niche, um, but it is a way to appeal to a certain type of customer. In a way, it could be a Halo product that attracts people and say, Oh, you know, that's that's cool. Alpina takes watches seriously and watchmaking history seriously. And I think it's not a terribly complicated or expensive way to to restructure uh, a movement in this way and then to create a cool messaging around it. So it could, it could work. I believe that the first uh, self-finding watches ha- were also like this, or they, they, they worked uh, a similar way. I think it was Breguet who invented the uh, the self winding watch back in the like the late seventeen hundreds or something like that and they had some some sort of a similar uh, way of operating where of course it, it didn't make a full rotation but it was more like a bumper kind of a thing or a hammer kind of thing that um, would oscillate but it would not make a full rotation. Just think, Alex, you wouldn't have to worry about the full three hundred and sixty degrees for the maintenance of this watch. You only have to worry about three hundred and thirty degrees. Is that appealing to a high class uh, watch regulator like yourself? It's this is such a strange watch. It's I don't know it's the <laughs> Betamax tape recorder, right? Of watches. I just know whenever you meet someone or a fellow uh, vintage watch enthusiast, if they have. A watch with a bumper movement in it and you kind of ask you don't know yet and you ask them what's the movement and they say oh it's a bumper it's a bit like if you meet someone and you find out they've got like a ginger <laughs> child or something they can you can all sense each other's disappointment and in, in finding that out you're only really buying this for the the looks of it and i think you're far better off getting is it the hamilton mechanical that has a similar uh-huh. dial and case for maybe one third of the price I can understand why they're doing a movement like this. It is a point of difference, but a lot like the Betamax recorder, VHS is obsolete anyway. Regular mechanical watches are pretty much obsolete. (laughs) So why go for the worst (laughs) option of the obsolete thing? Double obsolescence. Yeah, Yeah, maybe it's like a double negative. Like it's so obsolete, it's now (laughs) obsolete. There's one of our grammar questions. If you can be obsolete, can you also be sleet? Yeah, I think it's a very good point, which is you're paying a lot of money for a watch design, a kind of 1970s retro look that you can buy elsewhere a lot cheaper. I mean, it's a very nice looking watch if you're into that sort of that, if that's your vibe. You're paying a significant amount of this portion for a movement and the ability to geek out on that movement and be ignored by your friends when you <laughs> start to try to tell them about it. Uh, Simon? <laughs> Yeah, so so this is actually the second iteration of um, this watch that Alpino released. Oh, no, no, Simon's bringing some. You hear that? Simon's bringing some knowledge to the game. I, I am bringing some knowledge. I'm gonna I'm gonna take uh, Ariel's um, <laughs> position here with this one. That, that's it. <laughs> I, I, Alex is officially the comedian, and Simon is officially the watch knowledge. <laughs> Look, if I, if I could only walk in uh, Ariel's shoes, that, that that'd be great. But no. So yeah, so this is the second iteration of it. The first one they released in 2021. Um, I've actually just done a video on the first one, which is why I know a lot about this watch. And um, it's a hugely attractive watch, I think. Um, I think the design of it is is great, and it's got those real vintage vibes about it. Um, it's got an exhibition case back, so you can see the movement, and they've given it kind of a almost a rose gold coppery colour. So it really is a, a, a... It's really easy on the eyes. You know, it's a beautiful thing to look at. Um, where I take issue with this is I think that Alpina's movements are all just too big. So the problem is, is the case size then has to be big to accommodate them. And, you know, this in the article, actually, it, it says how, you know, it's quite compact. It's 42 mil and the lug to lug is, is about the same because it's, it's effectively almost like a lugless design. But really, in practice, on my wrist, I just found this thing huge. And it really frustrated me because I loved the watch. I thought it was you know, look beautiful. Um, I could see myself being really drawn to something like this. But the fact that, you know, if you're going to 
create something that is trying to have the look and feel of a vintage watch, then make it the kind of size of a vintage watch. So make it 37, 38, 39 mil. Don't make it 42. And I think they, have, for me anyway, I think they had an opportunity to do something really interesting here. And I think they've just fallen at that hill, unfortunately. Okay, well, seeing as Simon has taken such a liking to large watches, <laughs> let's move this on to the largest and I think probably the most commented article of the week. This is the hands-on debut, the Blanc Palm 50 Fathoms Tech Gombesa. Now, I don't know what a Gombesa is, and we should probably keep whatever a Gombesa is away from Konstantin Chaikin, just in case he figures out it's some sort of animal and creates another watch for it. <laughs> this is a 47 mil. Uh, Blanc pan, you could use this as a hammer, no doubt. It does look, I mean, I really like the look of it, but who can explain to me, if, if, if possible, as to why to celebrate some anniversary, 17th anniversary of the 50 Fathoms, why you would create something so completely unwearable to the general public? Who fancies a go first? Why is it unwearable? Well, it's 47 mil. It's huge. Yeah, but it but it doesn't have any lugs. It, it basically, and and the bracelet is very, or the strap is very deeply integrated into it. So it's like the lug to lug measurement would still be relatively low if it was not for the stiffness of the strap itself. So that is what really adds to it. It's not the forty seven, but it's like the way the strap extends. I I haven't worn this watch yet, but yeah, it is it is needlessly large. Uh, even when you look at the case back, you see that the movement is not that large, so the whole watch could have been smaller. I think they just went really crazy with the architecture of and the structure of the of the case, and they were like, "This is what we want," and we will go with it. And you know, it's like 2012. <laughs> it, it, you can tell that some of these brands are still stuck in the in the in the 2010s. You know, like based on this design and and shape and and size and everything else. It, this would have been an amazing watch in 2014. But it's really weird now. Like you say, it, it is large, but it, it, it there are other problems with it as well. How much is it? It's like $28,000. Oh, jeez. <sighs> it ain't cheap. You're, pay, you're paying for the real estate. There's no doubt about that. I mean, uh, you're right. It has no lugs, but the strap does look like in order to get it to fit in your wrist, you're going to need to tighten it so tight that you're going to cut off the blood circulation to your fingers. <laughs> in right. order to get that strap to bend round properly. Because the worst thing about a watch this size, he says as a Panerai wearer, is if they start to rotate round your wrist because it's just mm. the most annoying thing known to man. Mm. I mean, probably not actually the most annoying, but it's close. I'm starting to get Doxa flashbacks here. <laughs> yeah, it's a good looking, it is a good looking watch. It's a good looking watch. I don't know... What does it? It's got an extra hand on it, which seems to be some sort of weirdo dive timer type thing. Anyone got? And it's got a helium escape valve, probably next to the equation of time, one of the most pointless uh, gimmicks on a watch. I've done some research oh. on this one, which I dubbed Simon Alex is looking to take back the title. <laughs> <laughs> the most. A, a dive watch so pointless you can't even time your cooking of pasta uh, on the bezel. So it's for a type of diving where you use something called a rebreather. So it basically recycles your air so you can stay down for longer. You can stay down for three hours, although I spoke to someone earlier and they said the three hour dive on a rebreather system isn't that long really and people can stay down even longer than that. Although why you'd want to stay diving for three hours, let alone more than that. What I also found out was that style of diving is actually one of the most dangerous types of diving. And again, a diver I was speaking to earlier on said they lost three people over a 15 year period with this, this type of diving. And it can be one in a hundred people doing this diving perish while they're doing it. So whether you want to die wearing a nice watch in your wrist, it, it is an attractive watch. But the three hour part of it, like people don't use their dive watches for diving anyway, unless you want to time halfway into an episode of Robin <laughs> the Regulator. It's not really worthwhile having that. I mean, that's all it can be used for. You, the, the, the hand moves around the dial mm -hmm. every three hours. So you can't set it independently from the time. It just, it, it just makes so little sense in so many weird and wonderful ways. Yeah, it beats the helium escape valve in terms of uselessness for every everyday excuse. Yes. At least it gives the dive company 28,000 reasons to come and fetch your body from the bottom of whatever trench you've dived into. Yeah. Have Bonk Bonk got a history of this? 
is this a thing they've done in the past? This kind of rebreather. Well, they had the X Fathoms mm -hmm. watch, yep. if you remember that, which I'm still not sure if they sold more than one of those <laughs> in the world. And that was a huge thing that had uh, things that would you could tell how deep mm -hmm. you were diving and stuff like that. That's that this is almost sensible compared to that, but somehow less usable because it's only usable with one particular type of diving that people tend not to do because of how dangerous it is. Um, and I actually thought it was funny reading uh, an article from another watch blog where uh, one of the journalists actually went along and did this type uh -huh. of diving with the watch. And it made me think about how desperate <laughs> watch journalists are to go to any kind of event at all, that they'll even go and do some kind of dangerous, <laughs> have a near-death experience to get a little holiday and get to, to wear a watch. Just devoted to the cause. All these yeah. watch journalists, they're just devoted. Aren't you, David? Oh yeah, I'm. I'm ready to go diving anywhere, especially with something as ridiculous as this, just to justify its existence. What what a ridiculous thing! Oh, honestly, and and a lot of it is like, I'm not sure if this exists in in uh, in English in Hungarian. There's we, we call this a secondary shame when when you're when you feel ashamed for somebody else, like you know when you're watching something like cringy. I think that I think it's the right <laughs> word when you're watching like. A television show and somebody just makes an episode full of themselves and you cringe and you feel like it's happening to you and I just zoomed in on this buckle and it says 50 fathoms tech and it says tech on the pit on the pin of the of the buckle and I'm like oh, how how compensatory and ridiculous is this it, it, it this does not apply to any other tool anywhere else out there and not even pro zoomer products or anything like that because it's so so ridiculous can you imagine like the shutter button on a Nikon saying tech or something like that it's a, or or the door handle on the car like tech you know it's it's just <laughs> why would you put that there and it's like it is this desperation to justify like oh have you mentioned that this is a tech pin <laughs> you know it's it's oh. maybe there was a lot of engineering went oh, into creating that sure. pin buckle we, we don't know it's a techy pin for sure yeah and it says uh, two years in development yeah likewise for the fonts and the dial i i don't know how many different i think every single line of text is in a different a type of fun. It, it is like the 2010s. It really is. Right, let's finally go to a watch. This is a watch brand that was at Watch and Wonders last year. I don't think, yeah, they didn't really attract a lot of footfall. I think it's just because they were just as you come in the door. I think this year, I think you might disagree with this, this brand might be starting to make some progress in terms of what it stands for as part of Richemont, and that's Baum and Mercier. They have added a GMT to the Riviera watch collection. David, you wrote this article. I, I'm starting to like this watch. Hashtag, is that okay? <laughs> Why not? Yeah, absolutely. I've seen, uh, I've seen the Riviera before with this cool wave dial, and I really like that. I, it, it's just such a great everyday watch. It's a uh, it's a sleeper in the sense that I I'm, I don't see people flocking to Bowman and Mercy and looking for their great everyday wear watch. But honestly, this is a great great option. They have the Bomatic movement in the three hand uh, watches that have five days of power reserve and I believe are Cosk certified. These GMT watches have a supplied ETA movement. It's not a Solito, it's an ETA. I'm not sure about Cosk here, but the price is the same. So you sacrifice a little bit there but you gain GMT and you're spending the same amount of money. I, I think these are just great. And the dial, the way the dial is made, I was really surprised because what they do is they create a sunburst texture first and then they apply these little wavelets that look like boomerangs of sorts that are matte and are in relief. And when you're moving the watch around in your hand, it does actually mimic the way uh, the lights uh, or the sunlight flickers on top of these little wavelets. And as cheesy as that sounds, it cheered me right Right up and yeah, Bowman Mercy doesn't go for Grand Seiko on it and write two pages on the glistening light that you know as the sun sets just outside of Neuchâtel uh, or anything like that <laughs> <laughs> you know but it, it would apply it's a three grand watch or just under three grand so it's not you know with Tudor price increases you're still a, a good thousand Swiss francs away from a Tudor GMT this brand is probably within Watch and Wonders going to be producing the most competitive watches. Maybe Tag will have some of their quartz pieces that are of a similar uh, price in the Aquaracer collection. But for a full up Swiss watch, I think the 
yeah, I think this is quite attractive. I'm, I am not necessarily surprised at myself. That I remember Bob and Mercy did a thing with Shelby that I thought was really, really nice yeah. a number of years ago. They then seem to have lost their way a little bit and just become folded into the pack of also rans within Richemont. But this really does look to me to be what could be a bit of a bit of a standout standout product. Alex, do you have any interest in Bob and Mercy whatsoever? Do you know what? It's it's actually a, a good looking watch and it looks like good value, but at the end of the day it still falls within that kind of hierarchy of the watch you want is a Nautilus, so you can't get one of those. So then you try and get a Royal Oak. If you can't get one of those, you get a Vacheron uh, overseas. It's it's still in that that pyramid someplace. And I think for a brand like this, they need to be making moves that set them aside from all the other brands. The last watch I remember from them was uh, they did a skateboard watch. And it was like a limited edition one in collaboration with a skateboarder. And it was such a cool, it was such a really, really cool watch. And it was the first watch I'd ever seen from them that actually caught caught my attention. But I just think, obviously, they're going to sell some of these because of that pyramid or hierarchy of integrated uh, steel sports watches I was talking about. But should brands make watches like that to just to generate money and should people buy watches as well that if they can't get the watch they want they end up getting one further further down the down the list i'm not i'm not sure if that's a a recipe for success for the longevity of a, a swiss watch company i'm kind of with alex on the um I, I look at the design and there are so many influences from other watches in here that i can almost imagine that they sat down you know in a board meeting and a planning meeting and, and said Okay, so you know, let's put all of the elements from the most popular dive watches together. So what would we have? Well, we'd have a wave dial from a Seamaster. We'd have an integrated bracelet arrangement from something like a, a Royal Oak. Um, you know, the same with the screws on the bezel. You know, and it starts to become a little bit, you know, come on, we need something a bit more original. So that that's my impressions of this one. But I think they'll sell. I think it's a great price point. Um, I think they'll probably do quite well with this one. Yeah, well, I'm actually quite looking forward to seeing one of these in the flesh, so no doubt we'll get that chance at Watches and Wonders. Good stuff. Well, thank you, gentlemen. That's been a good show. Thanks for joining in with the uh, reviews this week. Alex, Where you, this is just your warm-up act for a two-and-a-half watchmakers recording coming up. Correct. Yeah, I've got a two-and-a-half watchmakers recording tonight, so if people want to listen to between three and five hours of two and a half watchmakers probably drinking more than they're talking about watches then yeah <laughs> come and give us a Simon listen. where can people find you so you can find me on YouTube at escapement24 and also the same on Instagram and David where are you on the internet I'm on a blog to watch dot com and uh, on abtw underscore David on Instagram good stuff and you can find me at, at Rick TikTok. So do get in touch uh, with all or just one of us, whoever your favourite one is, whoever you think was actually knew the most about watches, get in touch with them and tell them congratulations. But other than that, goodbye. Bye, everyone. Goodbye, everyone. Goodbye. Goodbye.